All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Cosmic Matrix podcast with your host today, Bernhard Günther. And I have a very special guest this time, and this is Paul Levy. And Paul Levy is mostly known for his work on Wetiko, which I have many people, followers of my work, know I've quoted him a lot over the years, and I can highly, highly recommend his book. But just to give a little uh, short bio about Paul, Paul is a pioneer in the field of spiritual emergence. He is a wounded healer in private practice, assisting others who are also awakening to the dreamlike nature of reality. He's the author of Quantum Revelation, a Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality. That's his most recent book. Um, Awakened by Darkness, When Evil Becomes Your Father. And as I just mentioned, Dispelling Wetiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil. And also his book, The Madness of George W. Bush, A Revelation of Our Collective Psychosis. He is the founder of Awakening in the Dream Community in Portland, Oregon. An artist, he is deeply steeped in the work of Carl Gustav Jung, and he has been a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner for over 30 years. Paul's website is awakeninthedream.com. Welcome, Paul. I'm so happy to have you on here. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm so happy to be here with you, Bernard. Thank you so much for the invitation. Excellent. So I just want to show right away, this is the book Dispelling with Tico. And, uh, you know, it's definitely in my top 10. And when I first came across the book, I think 2013, also you released it shortly after. I don't even know how I came across it. But it's one of these books, you know, I underline a lot and have my notes and it's full of, you know, just exclamation marks. It's like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. I it resonate and it ties into my own work as well. And I also just want to show real quick Paul's most recent book, The Quantum Revelation, A Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality. We'll talk about this as well a little bit. Um, but what I found really fascinating when I was reading your book is also your personal story of how you came across the topic of Wetiko. And uh, I know you had a very interesting personal awakening experiencing, basically recognizing the dreamlike nature of reality of have, after having your own severe psychotic break and even being hospitalized in a psychiatric institution. So maybe you could share a little bit of what happened when, when you had this experience. For sure. And, you know, it's the context for my whole body of work. And so basically, um, when I, in my mid, in my mid twenties, I was deeply, deeply suffering because what had happened, my whole childhood was a really happy childhood. I was really, you know, kind of light filled, um, healthy kid. And, um, I'm not going to go into the story, but it wound up that my father was a really sick guy that he was to say he was a psychopath was it's almost an understatement. And, um, and being the only child, I became at a certain point, particularly when I was separating, when I was in college and, and I was individuating from him, which is a healthy thing to do, that catalyzed the most intense sort of this, this emotional abuse. Like, like all people, we act out our unhealed abuse on our you know, closest people in our lives. And so there's nothing out of the ordinary with that, but it was so intense and so severe and his whole thing was was trying to make me not individuate and separate. He saw that for some perverse reason as a threat to himself. And so, you know, I'm not going to go into the story right now, but it created enormous suffering. So I went from being a really accomplished, happy, healthy kid to once I got out of college a few years out, I was barely able to live my life. The The abuse had had kind of activated in my psyche and it was stopping me from living my life so intensely that I knew I had to deal with it. I couldn't just postpone coming to terms with it. So I went into my mind. I just began to, to assume the position of the witness. And, um, you know, and it was the only thing that I found that was, that was in any way helping with my suffering because I quickly figured out I couldn't figure my way out of my suffering with my intellect. So I just began watching and witnessing and, you know, just assuming that position of, of just the witness. And after a couple of years or a little bit under a couple of years of doing that, and we're talking hours a day, maybe average four hours a day, you know, when I had a teacher, all of a sudden I got hit by a bolt of lightning. As I'm sitting in meditation, it just ignited in my brain. And within the day, I went into such an altered state in which I began having the recognition that 
that we're having a collective dream. And I was actually seeing that and I was so excited. And so, you know, I, 24 year old kid, you can't possibly be prepared for, for that. So I was so excited and had such, you know, just enthusiasm about what I was realizing um, that it got me in deep trouble. Within that first day, I got, I got brought, you know, by ambulance to my first psychiatric hospital and became part of the psychiatric system. And I was diagnosed and medicated. And, you know, the whole while I was having this full-blown spiritual awakening, the, the likes of which we only can imagine. And it was happening. And that's what saved me. The fact that it was so clear inside of my own mind that I was having a spiritual awakening that all these, you know, authority figures, the psychiatrists who were reflecting back, oh, you have this, this chemical imbalance because, you know, the DSM-3 had just come out like one year before mm. and it announced the discovery of the chemical imbalance. So every psychiatrist, so in the next maybe um, 18 months, I was hospitalized three, four, five other times and every single time, because I was just a free agent out in the world, I, I, I was not in a container in an ashram or a monastery. So I had this propensity to freak people out and because I was so, it was like having this personality change from one day to the next. And the only thing, you know, psychiatrists are trained to pathologize. So they, of course, saw me through the lens of this newly discovered chemical imbalance. They were guaranteeing I would have this illness for the rest of my life, that I would need to be on, on pharmaceuticals for the rest of my life, that if I went off them, I would immediately have a psychotic break. And the thing I should say, as they're diagnosing me, I'm, I'm diagnosing them. I'm thinking, wow, these are like the stupidest people I've ever met. Because whenever I was trying to describe what, what I was experiencing, instead of hearing me, they just interpreted my experience in a way to confirm their diagnosis of me being pathological. And um, so I just, you know, quickly figured out I, I really should shut up and not express what I was experiencing and keep it to myself. But it was, it was a nightmare. That, that whole psychiatric experience was intense. But then what happened at a certain point, so I, I very quickly extricated myself from that. And, and, you know, for the next 10, 12 years, I was just working on myself, going to therapy, connecting with my dreams. And my spiritual awakening continued. And I understood that the psychiatric hospitalizations were sort of, instead of getting in the way of the awakening, were part of the awakening. They were a descent in the underworld. Um, and I began to, to have the recognition, wow, the same deeper, darker sort of evil energy that came through my father was coming through psychiatry. There were two channels in a way of the same darker energy. So that's when I began to understand, wow, it's like there's this non-local darker force, not just darker, there's a lighter force too. But I was tracking the darker force that certain people or institutions became instruments for that darker force. And it seemed like when somebody was connecting with who they are, with their light, that the darker forces got consolidated in a way to try to shut them down. So I was fortunate in that it took me a number of years of, of really tracking this and connecting with my dreams and, you know, just all sorts of things I was doing, whether it's, you know, making art or, you know, doing Buddhist meditation or studying alchemy or young, having shamanic experiences doing plant medicines, the whole nine yards. I was doing anything and everything I could to try to get back to myself because I was in deeply in trauma when I got out of the last hospital in 82 between the abuse from my father and the psychiatric abuse. I mean, I was in deep, deep trouble and it forced me so deep inwards and into myself. And that's when I began having dreams, night after night, the most amazing archetypal mm -hmm. dreams that were showing me what was happening and so I filled up journals and journals and journals to the point where I became so fluent in the language of dreaming. And, and that's one of the things that saved me. And so that, you know, fast forward then after a dozen years, you know, maybe in the, in the mid, early to mid 90s, I had integrated enough. And that's when I began teaching and having the realization, well, I'm still a work in progress, but I've, I've kind of discovered something through my process that it was sort of this initiatory ordeal that I actually have something I can offer other people who are also going through similar, because we're all going through our own sort of like, you know, shamanic initiatory ordeal. 
that I had something like a gift to offer based on my own experience that could actually help people. So that's when I began to, um, to teach and open up my practice and have groups. And that's what I've been doing since. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing, Paul. Yeah, that's very interesting because really literally like nowadays, you know, I mean, I've, I've talked about this as fall and written about the so-called mental illness, what people diagnose right. as a mental illness is actually a deeper spiritual initiation people are going through, but they have no context and it's being, you know, pathologized, so to speak. And even like, even just depression itself, what I realized, you I mean, not always even severe psychotic breaks, but depression itself is also not for the most part a mental illness, but a cry of the soul. Yeah, yeah. To adjust, like Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of health to be uh, uh, well, uh, to a profoundly sick society, right? Yeah. But we're trying to do this, and that's why we're getting depressed, right? Yeah. And then modern psych psychology with all the pharmaceuticals is trying to adjust the sick individual to the sick society instead of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Jung has a great quote. He goes, modern psychology um, is a psychology without the psyche, that they've written the psyche yeah. out of the equation. And yeah. yeah Totally right. I mean, it's tragic how many people in mental hospitals current day um, are actually having some form of spiritual awakening, or maybe that what that is their deeper process. They're having a shamanic initiatory process, a spiritual emergence, but it's not recognized, and then it's diagnosed, it's pathologized. They like for me, what happened as soon as I became diagnosed and they they medicated me, then I became sick, and then all of a sudden now I'm sick. Now, now the psychiatrists have evidence confirming their diagnosis that I'm mentally ill because I am sick, but they don't realize, you know, it's a feedback loop. They, they don't realize their, their complicity in creating. And yeah. so all of a sudden now I'm sick and that confirms to them their diagnosis. So they become even more fixed in their diagnosis. And, and then as soon at a certain point, then I became depressed after having this full blown spiritual awakening. And they're like, Oh, now you're in the depressed phase of the cycling of the bipolar mm -hmm. that even confirmed their, you know, in everything I was saying, they were interpreting through the lens of seeing me as a mentally ill person. So it was so insane and so abusive, my experience in psychiatry. But like I was saying, I, I've recontextualized it as a descent into the underworld, but I have really direct experience of the madness and the abuse mm -hmm. intrinsic to psychiatry. Yeah. You know, what you mentioned so, uh, before as well, it's also interesting, as you said, these uh, doctors or these institutions become instruments of this darker force without yeah. their awareness. But you also said, which is very, this almost this paradox, and we can go into that deeper when we talk about Wetiko, but it's paradox, you were pulled into the underworld experiencing evil, but at, at the same time, it was almost a necessary initiation, like part of your mm -hmm. learning lesson to, uh, to be initiated, the shamanic descent right, into the right. underworld. That, that I think is really, really important. And it, you know, it can trigger some people who are identified with the light and all this like new agey you know, sort of person. When, when I talk about the profundity of actually encountering you know, that, that evil, that darkness. And, you know, it's incredibly, it's like this dangerous thing because it can kill you or you, you can, you know, become identified with it or become so traumatized by it and so overwhelmed. But somehow I was able, you know, I was having this direct encounter with it. And it wasn't just the personal evil of my father, for example, there was like this higher demand, it was like archetypal evil and my father had just was so taken over by his unconscious that he unwittingly, he had no idea, had become a conduit or an instrument for this archetypal evil to come through him. And then what I began to realize, and you know, the same thing with psychiatry um, as a system, but what I, what I began to, to see was that that archetypal darker force that was coming through whatever the instrument was, my father, psychiatry, whoever, that it was non-locally informing the field. Mm -hmm. And so whenever here, I was actually having awareness of it. And whenever I would try to illuminate or point at it, the field itself would configure in a way so as to like protect the darkness. And then I became the one, I, I became the identified patient. Oh, you're the one who's evil. You're the mm -hmm. one who's crazy. You're the one who's sick. It was such a mind fuck. But I see now that it, something was being shown to me that through that experience that almost killed me, there was this 
like like I said, something was being shown to me. And fortunately, over the years, I've been able um, to integrate it or to understand it or connect the dots and to find the language. And my work is all about just pointing at what I, not just me, but all of us are experiencing this moment by moment in our lives, but most of us are not aware of it. Yeah. And then, then we unwittingly become complicit in the darkness that we're not that we're not awake to. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and it's a true shamanic initiation. What you've, you know, what you've been through, basically. That's and also very much the archetypal uh, journey of the wounded healer, right? Through yeah, your yeah, own. Yeah. No, definitely. And I, 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 because I don't identify when people say, "Oh, you know, they're a healer," and it's such a a charged word. I never felt comfortable with that. I always had an image of healers putting their hands on people when they be healed, and that wasn't me. But um, the idea of being a, a healer who's wounded, you know, the archetype of the wounded healer, which is the shamanic archetype, that I resonate with. Because even to this day, you know, because that was when I was in my, I was 24 when my awakening happening. I'm almost 63. And I'm still dealing with, you know, my trauma. And because we're all in trauma with my wound. But instead of it being problematic in the way that it was, you know, way back when, I'm able to carry it and hold it, and it becomes like this this portal through which, in a way, I access my gifts. And that's the archetype of the wounded healer, and that's an identity that I feel I feel comfortable with presenting myself as being. Yeah, and we all, I feel, living out this archetypal journey in our own ways if we are stepping into the spiritual path, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. I mean, right, because the thing that I realized is that what I was going through it was an iteration of a deeper fractal that that collectively our species is going through. We're all in trauma, mm -hmm. yeah. We're all fated to come to terms with the shadow. And, and you know, when I say shadow, not just personal shadow, but absolutely personal shadow, yeah. but the personal shadow then opens up to the archetypal shadow. And that's, that's, that's archetypal evil. And that's a shattering to quote young. He has a famous quote where he says, you know, something like, oh, yeah, it's it's one thing to encounter personal evil. But when you encounter archetypal evil, it's a shattering experience. Yeah, it's traumatizing. And it really shattered me. And I still deal with it every day, having this face to face encounter with archetypal evil. But somehow I've been able to connect with my heart and keep my awareness and cultivate compassion. And, you know, that's really saved me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's interesting because on the path, I can relate to that. The more if we have these kind of experiences on a deep personal level, this transcending experience, but then also we not only get in touch with our deeper unconscious, our shadow, our traumas, our individual stuff, so to speak, but tapping into the collective and becoming more sensitive to the suffering of the world. I mean, that's also in Tibetan Buddhism, the Bodhisattva path, right? Once yeah, yeah. you, you know, the service to self, you also feel the suffering of, of the world of the us. It's not only your own stuff, but then you're also being called to be of service, right? Yeah, yeah, and that that really helped me, that understanding what you just articulated um, in the sense that, because it's so easy when we're going through our particular process to personalize it and think, oh, this is just my own personal process, which it is. But yet, there's a when you tap into like the really deep dimension of your experience, it's archetypal and that that means that what you're experiencing is unfolded in the collective field. It's what all of our species is experiencing and that all of a sudden recontextualizes it because it, instead of it being problematic in a certain way or taking it personal or thinking oh i'm just all screwed up you understand wait a second i'm actually experiencing as an individual what our species is experiencing yeah. and and like you were saying in tibetan buddhism with the, the idea of the bodhisattva the bodhisattva voluntarily you know takes on that experience of suffering you know, with the intention of, well, if I can maybe experience this fully and consciously, then, you know, I'd be willing to do that. If it would take it off of everybody else, they wouldn't have to deal with this, you know, this burden. And yeah, so all of a sudden, not only does it recontextualize, but it connects you, it snaps you out of the separate self. Mm -hmm. and it actually connects you with, wait a second, who I actually am is interdependent, interconnected, and all of a sudden you have a wider sense of identity that's not separate from anybody, from the whole universe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel also it instills then, because it's interesting, you work on yourself, you want to heal yourself, but then the deeper you dive with all your stuff, then you actually open yourself up to the collective and uh, really experiencing non-separation. 
and then feeling the more the suffering the, of the collective. Also, I think the deeper lesson behind it is also having this deeper compassion, right, of yeah, yeah, humanity, yeah. right, well, humanity. Having that compassion, if you know, and that's something you know. I mean, every day I'm I'm still. I mean, everybody, even His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, "Oh, every day I I expand my altruism, my compassion." It's not like you ever get to the end of it. Yeah. And compassion is exactly right as far as, you know, in my work on like the whole Watiko idea, I talk about that compassion is the Watiko sort of dissolver par excellence, you know, because compassion is really an expression, an energetic expression of the realization of the dreamlike nature. Because the dreamlike nature, you discover, oh, wow, we're all characters in each other's dreams. We're not separate. We're interconnected and interdependent. And that's to see through the separate self and the expression of that realization is compassion. Yeah, beautifully said. So um, let's dive into a little bit into the topic of Wetiko. Oh, yeah. And you know what you just shared from your personal experiences and the, in the 90s and integrate, leading into the 90s, integrating the experiences, establishing your practice and still learning and studying and trying to understand, making sense out of, out of your experience. And how, how did this lead you to the topic of Oetika? And I know it's, it's mostly based on what you also wrote in the beginning in your dedication to the activist Jack D. Forbes, the author of Columbus and other cannibals who yeah. first talked about Oetika. But yeah. you really, um, I cannot actually comment on his book. I haven't read his book, but I feel you have uh, taken it a step further and really tying it into Jungian psychology and many other topics. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, share a little bit about your journey into the discovering Watiko, this alien virus. So basically, before I had come across Watiko, I didn't know the name. I, I had written a book about during George W. Bush's presidency, I was so freaked out. And little, little did I realize that, oh, my God, he was like, you know, he was a gift compared to whatever. <laughs> but... um. But I was so freaked out by George W. Bush, and I wrote a book about his madness, and he's getting dreamed up to embody and reflect our own madness. And, and I didn't have the word Watiko. I called it malignant egophrenia, or ME disease. And what it is is like where this, you know, this part of the psyche subsumes all the other parts into its pathology. And, um, and you know, so that was really the, the whole book about the madness of George Bush. And I think I had like one little paragraph that I'd come across Watiko in Forbes' book. But um, then as I began studying his book more and more, I realized, oh my God, the Native Americans, because it's a Native American term, they actually have been tracking malignant egophrenia, this very non-local psycho-spiritual disease of the soul that I had written about in The Madness of George Bush, and um, that the Native Americans had been tracking this for centuries. So what I did with, um, you know, the book that I wrote on Watiko as a Westerner, as a modern person, I just, you know, tried to um, interpret it through this psychological idiom and um, bring in the work of Jung. And because in every wisdom tradition and so many creative artists and even in science, they're pointing at Watiko in just their, their own different way, you know, in different symbol system. And, um, you know, and particularly because here I was having this, this living experience of this non-local higher dimensional force that had come through my father, the family system in psychiatry. And I was recognizing, wait, there's something deeper. This, like it's like a higher dimension of our existence that's informing and choreographing and playing out through events in our, in our world. And, and certain people become in a way the minions or the outposts for this disease. And so that's what kind of inspired me to write the book on Watiko to really articulate it and map it because it operates through the blind spots of the unconscious. So what that means is that, yeah, we can't see it. And so what my work is trying to do is pointing out how it works through the unconscious blind spots, through you know, um, possessing certain people or configuring events in the world um, because when a person sees this Watiko energy, then all of a sudden you take away its power and you become empowered. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one other thing, I was beginning to realize when I was saying, when I had my awakening, I was recognizing the dreamlike nature of reality. One other way of articulating that was, you see, think about Watiko. Watiko is an inner disease of the soul. It's a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul that somehow it expresses itself through the medium of the outside world. 
So it somehow extends itself into the outer world, even though it sources within our psyche, and it somehow configures and choreographs events in our world so as to express itself. And what that means is that when you see that, that actual happening, that correlation between the inner and the outer, that's an expression that you're, of, that you're connecting to the dreamlike nature. Because what is a dream? A dream, uh, you know, think about when you're inside of a dream, what is the, the dreamscape? It's actually expressing and reflecting the inner state of the psyche. That's mm-hmm. what a dream is. And I'm saying that's, that's totally relevant to actually understanding what Tico. It's an inner disease of the soul that actually explicates itself through the medium of the outside world. Mm-hmm. So because, yeah, that's, that's, that was very interesting to read in your book because you also make the distinction almost like it's, there's a certain paradox because there's, you know, it has this subjective quality of just being a projection of the unconscious, you know, this disease. But there's also, no, like you wrote in the book, there's an objective reality to it. It's almost like, can you say that Wetika is almost like an entity in itself has its own intelligence, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's separate from us, but at the same time, part of us. There's this paradox. Yeah, right? yeah, very paradoxical. And that's what makes it so hard to understand because to say, oh, the thing about Watiko, it's just a projection of the mind. No, no, that's not true. It's not just a subjective projection of the mind. But then if somebody were to say, well, if it's not a projection of the mind, well, then it objectively exists. No, no, it doesn't objectively exist. You know, quantum physics, and I want to, you know, at a certain point, I would like to bring in quantum physics because that's the yeah. medicine. What quantum physics has discovered is the medicine for Watiko. So it's not a projection of the mind. It's not objective. There's this other realm in between that it exists in. You can call it, um, Corbin calls it imaginal realm. Jung calls it the reality of the psyche, where it has an ontological status in and of its own, on its own terms. And so subjectively, we, the way we experience Watiko is as if it actually exists as an entity separate from us. That's our subjective experience. From the ultimate point of view, there's no such thing as Watiko. It doesn't even exist. It has no independent objective existence whatsoever separate from our own mind. So here's something, here's the paradox. Watiko doesn't even have any independent intrinsic existence. It doesn't exist at all. And yet it can destroy our species. Mm-hmm. That's the paradox. And um, because the thing about Watiko, it's a quantum phenomena. And what I mean when I say a quantum phenomena, just like, you know, what is the nature with physics? They'll try to understand, well, here's this light. What is the nature of light? Well, depends how you observe. It can manifest as a particle or a wave, depending on how you set up your experiment and the questions you ask. Well, the same thing with Watiko. Watiko is it like this superposition of states. Encoded in Watiko is the deepest evil that our species is capable of that can destroy our species and superpose within encoded hidden within Watiko is it not only its own medicine but a blessing it literally is helping us to wake up to the dreamlike nature and to who we are that if Watiko didn't exist we would have to invent it it's actually helping us but if we don't recognize that aspect of it then its evil aspect consolates and it destroys us so it's mm, a yeah. It's a very trippy phenomena. Very, yeah, yeah, very fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was writing down some quotes from the book, but again, like there's so much I've underlined. <laughs> like one of it's, it's really fast. I, again, to all the listeners, if you haven't uh, read the spelling Wetiko, Wetiko, the breaking the curse of evil, definitely get the book. Um, but you know, there's you know, here's some quotes I want to just quote you from the book, which kind of relates to what you just said. Humanity isn't just asleep; it loves its sleep, and it has abandoned itself to sleep. The ignorance is not a neutral, passive state, not merely an absence of knowledge, but is a counter-reaction to knowledge, actively induced and maintained, so as to prevent the arising of knowledge of humanity's true origin and situation. So it really wants to, you know, it doesn't want to be discovered. It come, you know, almost distracts us with like Plato's shadows on the wall, yeah, like yeah. with all our projections, like you know, to to not to keep being hidden in the psyche or in, in the in the hyperdimensional realm, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's exactly it. The thing about Watiko, I mean, it 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 can't stand to be seen because when you see how it operates through in the outside world and through your reactions, your unconscious reactions, in other words, through your mind, when, when you see that, then all of a sudden you take away its autonomy, its omnipotence. It doesn't have the power it did 
and you simultaneously empower yourself. And so what Watiko does, one of the, so we, it's this form of like blindness. It's a psychic blindness that actually believes not only that it's sighted, but it believes that it's more sighted than the people who actually are sighted. And so the way it works, it, it distracts us from inquiring within. And uh, so then we always, you know, if we're under the spell of Watiko to whatever degree, and we're all under the spell of Watiko at any given moment to think, oh, that person has Watiko and we don't. Well, Watiko feeds off a of polarization. Yeah. So that viewpoint, all of a sudden, you're unwittingly under the thrall of Watiko if you, if you see somebody else and concretize them as having Watiko. And so what it does, it actually distracts us and it, it, so we project because it works through the projective tendencies of our mind. And we're always projecting yeah. the inkblot of, of waking life. But it operates through the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that we become entranced by our projections. We literally hypnotize ourselves. So we all have this like creative sort of this genius for how we moment by moment co-create reality. What Tico plugs into that and turns it against ourselves so that, like I was saying, we hypnotize ourselves and, um, and we then become entranced by our own projections such that we become conditioned by them and we react to them as if they're separate from us. And the whole source of that experience is our own mind. There's yeah. no one else doing that to us. Yeah. No, it's, that's fascinating because it also ties into we all, most people, or many of us, we just identify with thought and believe our own thoughts. Not understand there can be these quote unquote thought injections of this Watiko, uh, yeah. you know, energy, which are not even our own thoughts or what you're going to call environmental consciousness from other people, the collective, just feeding off these thoughts, you know, and, and then identifying with it. And then the projections come uh, accordingly, right? Because, yeah. it, like you said, it can be very subtle. It's sometimes very subtle. It's not this like possession, demonic, whatever. But like you mentioned, even when we have, in my, I can see it in myself. You have certain awakening experiences and you can fall easily in the, what I call the trap of superiority. Oh, I'm so awake. People are so asleep, yeah. right? Right there is Wetiko working through me, right? Through the, the judgment. Oh, 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 totally. And the thing about, um, you know, it, it works through like we have, we all have like the, these, these vulnerabilities. So it's a very subtle thing. It's not like you were saying like this overt, oh, I'm possessed. No, just having a particular point of view that we might not even be aware of, or maybe having a thought and then identifying with the thought or then with our habitual patterns or, you know, we have like the, you know, whether whatever sort of addictions that you're having, you know, because understanding like with, with trauma Addiction is a way of really understanding, deepening our understanding of Watiko. Because if you think about it, we then, say if we're in trauma, right? Um, well, what we typically do is, oh, I'm in trauma. The, the way I'm trying to heal my trauma actually recreates the very trauma I'm trying to heal from in an infinitely self-perpetuating feedback loop. Mm -hmm. that's, in a way, that's a way of describing Watiko. That, you know, we actually you know, are complicit, we, we are participating in our own enslavement, but we're doing that unconsciously. And, and one of the ways, one of the major ways that you had just touched on was with our thoughts. We'll have thoughts and, you know, it's a radical difference between when you have a thought and you invest into the reality of the thought and you identify with the thought. You know, even, even Buddha himself in the Dhammapada, the sayings of the Buddha, the very first saying is, we create this universe with our thoughts. So thoughts are incredibly powerful things. But when we're just unconsciously identifying with our thoughts, well, you know, um, okay, one example of this is like with Watiko, it's like having a tapeworm inside of our system. And with a tapeworm, a tapeworm will secrete chemicals that you'll crave food that feeds the tapeworm. So the tapeworm gets bigger, you're the host, until it actually kills you. And then it has to suffer the inconvenience of finding another host. But the point is, as we're eating that food that's inspired by that tapeworm, we're thinking we're acting on our own impulses. Mm. But there's actually some sort of alien energy that's not part of our wholeness that's underlying that particular impulse to eat that food. Mm. And it's very much like that. There are certain thoughts or perspectives that aren't ours, that, that aren't part of our nature. But if we don't recognize that, then we're going to identify with it and, um, and act that out. And if I can just say one more thing, because it's so 
helpful in the apocryphal texts. Of course, this got written out of the Bible. They talk about what they call a counterfeiting spirit, and that's what Tico. And what, what this counterfeiting spirit does, it puts us on. And putting us on has a double meaning. Putting us on means putting us on like a suit of clothes, so it impersonates us, but it also puts us on by it's, it's deceiving us, it's fooling us. So then it presents us with this version of ourselves that's a false version, because it's aping us, it's, it's, it's just doing this, this mimicry of who we actually are. If we're not awake in that moment, we will then identify with its false version of who we are, and then all of a sudden we've given ourselves away. We've given our true nature away and we've identified with who we're not, with a limited version of who we are. And we've fallen under the spell of Watiko. That is Watiko in a nutshell. Mm, yeah, that is so true because most people in general, like even myself, like if you're not engaged in some basic spiritual practice, self-work, meditation practice, or even basic self-psychotherapeutic work, somatic work, we automatically identify with our desires, impulsions, and whatever, and just mechanically act them out, thinking right. that's my own stuff. That's just what you do, right? Yeah. Be it even sexual impulses or eating whatever. It can be even, or any lower nature stuff, you know, it's, we don't question it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, whatever impulse or thought, we don't have space around it. We just immediately, you know, identify with it and act it out. So in a way, then we act it out compulsively. And then the, the, the more we do that, the more that impulse gets strengthened, like an addiction. And, that, and we're unwittingly feeding that feedback loop that's actually killing us. So the thing about what Tico is that, like I'm saying, there's nothing out there that we need to be afraid of. It's not like, oh, you know, Paul's talking about this, you know, this, you know, really dangerous, deadly virus to the mind, because it's a virus of the mind, and I have to be afraid, because no, if we're afraid, having fear feeds into Watiko, yeah. you know, and um, so, yeah, the, the idea being is just to, um, you know, have that spaciousness, and so that when you have an impulse or a thought, you can actually contemplate it and discern, oh, is this me? Is this coming from me? Is this what, is this going to serve me if I act this out or, or is it not, you know? And, um, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's so profound for me because what I wrote about, you know, it's not just something that's happening now. It's been happening for millennia and, but more and more of the evil in our world, it's like coming out from hiding. It's no longer underground or in the shadows. It's all over the place. And, and so here I am, you know, having written these books about, you know, evil and how, you know, if you hold it in a certain way and you understand if you're like seeing the evil out there, that's actually reflecting that same energy in you. And that's what we need to attend to. It's like, so, you know, it's kind of funny for me because here I've like, you know, presented this work. And yeah, there are people like you and a lot of you know, people who study my work who are really appreciating it and into it. But the majority of our species is seemingly so asleep around, they just hear about my work, oh, a virus of the mind, a cancer, oh, this guy is obviously new age woo woo crazy. And what can I do, you know? Yeah, welcome to the club. I've experienced the same projections. <laughs> you know you have, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I think more. Uh, there's something. Yeah, it, I think more people waking up. But that ties into. Well, we can go into so many different directions. So let me just uh, retract. So, yeah. but I want to just uh, acknowledge because I can see myself how we t we t we t where Tico comes in in everyday life. Sometimes, if I'm not mindful, I'm not present through my own blind spots. Something just comes in, triggers me, and I become mechanical. Boom! It throws me off, yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of that. But I also recognize what you said, that's very important to undermine, which is also the paradox in itself, the paradox of evil in itself, that it is, uh, it is a disease and medicine at the same time. Yeah. You know? Because I also know they tag into our blind spots, our wounds and traumas. So even if you study certain esoteric traditions we can get into as well, who we'll talk about the similar phenomenon, phenomenon of occult forces, they you know, have a teaching function from the higher perspective of the evolution of consciousness. So if you have the ability to observe, they highlight your stuff. They put that fuel onto your issues to, you know, to yeah, get yeah. more luge out of it. But um, 
you can use it as a medicine because it really highlights the stuff. So you take responsibility, not fall into victim blame projection and all of that, and then utilize it. And the, the way out to heal it is like you said, it's not externally fighting this, this enemy, but you, it brings you better closer, uh, closer to who you truly are, to closing the wounds, your blind spots to stay more mindful and aware, which then closes the entry point, so to speak for with Tico. Yeah, 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 no, that's absolutely right. And, um, to the extent that we're able, in a way, you know, so say we'll see the darkness out there, and if we have the recognition that it's reflecting, that it's, you know, like a dream that we're looking at in a mirror, and if, we're, if we then put our attention on, oh, yeah, what is that reflecting of in myself, and, and particularly when we react, like say something dark will happen out there, somebody will do something abusive or in the body politic or whatever, and then we react, that's that's the all of a sudden instead of putting our attention out there to immediately turn our attention back on wow what is the source of that reaction what is that showing you know that's an incredible opportunity and um you know so and that's actually a practice in tibetan buddhism it's a practice probably in every spiritual tradition and um and the thing about what if i if i can just give an example of how it works through the projective tendencies of the mind because you know, what I'm trying to do with my work is just really trying to find the words to help other people to see, because, you know, we're all experiencing it 24-7, um, but like I said, it operates through the blind spots. It operates through our turning a blind eye, through looking away, and because so many, you know, people, oh, I don't want to have to look at darkness. If I look at evil, then it's feeding it. Well, in one level, that's true. If you if you get become too fascinated by evil, yeah, that's not good. Then you're giving it energy. But if you avoid it and look away out of fear, then you're feeding it also. But what I'm pointing out is like, no, we need to see it. We need to see how it operates and then see how it operates in the world, through the non-local field, in our own mind, through our reactions. And then as a sovereign being, we get to choose how we place our attention. Okay, I see you, evil. I see you, Watiko. Now I want to place my attention over here in creating the world I want to live in. And that's the way to deal with what go instead of just avoiding it, turning a blind eye, or becoming fascinated by it. Yeah. Okay? And then what the thing I was going to say about the actual the actual dynamic of Watiko, because it's so um I'm just wanting people to understand this. You know, say, so we all have a shadow, you know, that's, that's a, you know, kind of understood thing, both personal and archetypal dimension of the shadow. Well, if I'm not in touch with my shadow, if I split off from my shadow, because, you know, okay, I don't, who, who does want to deal with their own darkness, right? So we all split off to whatever degree from our own shadow. And then what happens? We project it out. And being like a dream, if we project out the shadow into the waking dream, will come a person or a group of people or a nation or whatever who will actually embody and will carry that projection of our shadow. And then they'll be like actually incarnating our own shadow that we've projected out and split mm. off. As soon as they do that, now we have evidence confirming to us that the shadow's out there. And of course, then we're identified with just light and righteousness. So then as soon as, you know, they embody the shadow and we have the evidence, it actually even more entrenches us in the viewpoint that the darkness is outside of us. So that's the feedback loop that we're then actually participating in. And the more we then project out the shadow, what happens? At a certain point, we want to kill the person who's embodying that shadow because yeah. that's reflecting the very inner process that started the whole thing of wanting to kill our own darkness by projecting it out. So then we try to, you know, in the ultimate sense, try to kill the carrier of the shadow. And by doing that, we literally have then become possessed by the very shadow that we projected out and are trying to kill. And the whole thing is madness. And yeah. that's the psychological dimension of what he yeah. you, you just summarized the majority of our history, basically. Yeah, yeah, I love <laughs> And it's totally playing out current day in the body politics. Exactly. That's a perfect segue because, yeah, okay, let's just look at some of more like uh, current events and like more real life examples of how you see this uh, Wetiko alien virus manifest and out, out, act out in the world at large right now in current events, especially on, on the political level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And wow, that's some question because, you know, um, 
it does make a difference whether you think Trump is the greatest thing since sliced bread or whether you think Trump is just like, you know, the embodiment of Watiko. You know, the idea being that the body politic is so incredibly polarized right now mm. in a way that I've never experienced it in my lifetime. And, and the thing which is interesting, there are two things. One is in a dreaming process, when darkness really becomes more and more apparent, it's an expression that a very powerful light is really nearby that's casting mm -hmm. darkness, you know? And the other thing is when there is intense polarization, that's also an expression for, in the realm of psyche of like there's something pregnant that's, that's mm -hmm. gestating and potentially being given birth to. And so, um, you know, so many, because I have a lot of friends who are like these liberal progressive people who are, you know, really well-intentioned and they, they have this incredible reaction to Trump, you know? And, you know, when I see that part in myself too, but I understand that, oh, but in my reacting to what I'm perceiving as the evil out there, then I'm actually feeding, unwittingly complicit in feeding the very evil I'm reacting to. So I'm actually part of the problem if I'm just unconsciously reacting and feeling self-righteous. So what's playing out in the body politic, I would say, is demanding us to get actually even more in touch with our own internal process, you know, because that's the, that's where the medicine is. That's the place to really like shed light on, you yeah. know. Yeah. Now, it would definitely, that's an extreme in this day and age, the left versus right polarization, especially in this country. And like you said, like, I don't, you know, I'm not, for me, I'm neither left or right. That's like, I just have a very different perception and view on all of this duality game, so to speak, right. especially on the surface political level, which, you know, it's a topic on its own. But um, it was very fascinating to see when Trump got elect, which elect, elected or selected, we don't know. Yeah. Um, but the because for me, I, have, I can be more in an objective, quote unquote, observer because I'm not identified with either side. So you naturally like, can see things more where they are. So it was just fascinating to see the left deliberates of like first being this loving kind of people who were like, you know, almost the good force of the world turn into the opposite and their shadows coming up and these literally very hateful, angry projections against Trump. I remember down in downtown, they had like built puppets of Trump and burned them. I mean, that is literally, like you said, they became that what they were, what they were actually fighting against and Watiko took them over. Yeah, right? yeah. no, that, that's totally true. Because the thing about Watiko that's important to understand, um, yeah, it's both an individual thing and it's, it's like this, this collective psychosis, you know, it's something, and it's so amazing to me that we're in the middle of a psychic epidemic of a collective psychosis, you know, right now that's like all over the planet, that our species is afflicted with this yeah. incredible collective madness. And very few people are actually talking about it, you know, and that's really interesting. And that I see as an expression of the madness that we're so absorbed in it. It's become just the way things are and normal that, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll get like, we'll talk about this shooting or that political thing or whatever. But what about actually having like a more expansive viewpoint and just having the recognition, wow, take a look at what we're doing. We as a species, we are destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet. We're actually creating like collective suicide. And there's no question about that. I mean, you know, if you deny that, well, then you're just, you have your eyes closed. And what I'm interested in is how come we're doing that? How come we as, as humanity, as the human species, are actually um, killing or, or, you know, like I said, you know, creating collective suicide? And I, the only way I can articulate my answer, and I'm not even sure, you know, I mean, I welcome anybody to deepen my answer. And, and I want to just point out quantum physics, which I, I look forward to getting mm -hmm. a little bit. It, one of the things I learned in writing that book was that oftentimes asking the right question is more important than finding the right answer. Mm -hmm. And so to ask the question, how come we're collectively killing ourselves and destroying the biosphere? My answer is, well, we're doing that as the way to learn how to not do that, which we clearly haven't learned or we wouldn't be doing it. So that, that, what that's pointing out is that encoded in the acting out of our destruction, encoded in that is the medicine to teach us how not to do that. You know, and that's an example of Watiko, that encoded in the pathology is the medicine. 
Yeah, yeah. And also in times like these, actually, from a higher perspective, this intense uh, intensification of uh, polarization and drama and friction and more suffering as is just coming up for people, something is happening. But that's actually the almost what I call the call of the divine of spirit of like, you know, how much more do we have to suffer until we get the message? This is the opportunity, right? Of like, we keep doing the same things over and over. Right, right, right. And that's, you know, in doing the same things over and over, that's a definition of insanity. It's also like one of the symptomologies of trauma, like the, the traumatized soul. It, it's doing the very thing that's creating the trauma mm -hmm. trying to heal from. So you just described that. And yeah, it's like, um, you know, I'm in private practice and, you know, people on the surface, everybody seems to be, well, having such a, you know, whatever, just doing well. And when you really get to connect with people, everybody is deeply suffering and um you know and it feels more and more like you know so many people for years have postponed coming to terms with their suffering oh i'll deal with it tomorrow oh i'm okay and whatever more and more people are not able to postpone coming to terms with that incredible deep suffering that's coming up and that can be a blessing because it can really force you to shed light on what is the source of that suffering because in my work on watiko i point out and this is from tibetan buddhism this is directly from the teaching of the buddha that the cause of the suffering is our grasping is our mm -hmm. grasping on to so if you if you remember i was saying that in the menace of, of george w bush book i didn't know the word watiko so much i called it malignant egophrenia me disease me disease it's mm -hmm. a identification of who we think we are so we then actually identify with this reference point in space and time i.e the ego and then we become identified with that which doesn't even exist in the way that we're imagining it does and then we invest all of our energy in defending and protecting that identity which is which is an illusion and and that grasping and clinging according to the buddha that's the ultimate fundamental source of our suffering that's the source of watiko and, and it becomes a self-fulfilling, a self-fulfilling prophecy where we literally then have identified with being who we're not, like I was saying before, and we give away our true nature. Because the thing about Watiko, it can't steal our soul at all, yeah, but what yeah. it, can do, it can trick us into giving mm. our soul away. Mm. Yeah. So it's a deceiver and it's a shapeshifter and it's continually deceiving us. And this is what the Bible, they'll talk about the devil or Satan. Every spiritual tradition talks yeah. about this sort of energy. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's what makes a wisdom tradition if they're actually illuminating what the indigenous people are calling what Tico. Exactly. I mean, that also reminds me of what you wrote in Dispelling with Tico. Like a werewolf, the Wetiko is sometimes portrayed as a shapeshifter who can even appear disguised as a good spirit. That's what people, evil doesn't appear like in this horror movie, like a demon all the time, but like it's even the written Satan most often appears as an angel of light in the, in the cloak appearance of goodness, so to speak, yeah, right? Totally. And that's, you know, I mean, I can talk for me. I mean, who among us? I, I, I can't say I haven't, you know, who hasn't like, you know, fallen into their unconscious and, you know, fallen yeah. into self-deception and acted out their unconscious with the best of intentions in a way that afterwards you realize, oh my God, what was I doing? I was like acting out something that was hurtful or that was not conscious, even though I had assumed it was. So you see, the thing about Watiko is that um, sort of we have in our psyche this, this, this monitoring system and it disables that so that we can't detect when something's like it because it's kind of like an alien invader i mean yeah, yeah. Castaneda talks about that i mean Castaneda, you know talks about word for word watiko he just calls it different name um you know and um yeah so that that monitoring system becomes disabled to the point where you know who among us hasn't acted out or in it's what christ was saying you know let he who hasn't sinned cast the first stone yeah. so all played out Watiko, but the idea is, is when you see that to really acknowledge it and to feel the remorse or the regret and to understand, yeah, I'm susceptible to that until I become utterly and fully enlightened and who is, yeah. that I actually, you know, in potential can, with the best of intentions, can fall under the spell of Watiko and having that viewpoint, that's the immunization. Yeah. Watiko, people who say, oh no, never, I can never fall under Watiko, I'm fully conscious, 
I run the other way when I meet people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's the, through the unconscious, so literally the unconscious matrix agents, so to speak. You know, and what you wrote about, yeah, I want to get into that more in the second hour, uh, but also other resources, you know, you've come across uh, talking about the Wetiko phenomenon, especially also you wrote some uh, very excellent articles on uh, like the enlightened madness of Philip K. Dick, the Black yeah. Iron Prisoner with Tico. Yeah. Then also Colin Wilson's book, The Mind Parasites. Yeah, so yeah, we can yeah. talk about that, Kastanate, and also go a bit into Sri Aurobindo's work and Integral yeah. Yoga. Uh, but to finish it off before the first hour, of, uh, I really want to also like touch upon a little bit before we finish the first hour on um, quantum physics and especially your recent book, The yeah. Quantum Revelation, which um, yeah. I haven't fully finished yet, but it's, it's very fascinating. And you also see what you just mentioned, this quote unquote solution or how to get off, us out of the Wetiko situation. Yeah. So there's like a link between trauma, Wetiko and quantum physics. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And so just very simply how I would describe the whole, um, you know, quantum physics as far as having, how it has to do with the Wetiko is that quantum physics has proven that, so this world that, before quantum physics, the classical physics was studying. They thought it was an objective world and we were just passive observers trying to understand the workings of this separate objective world. Quantum physics comes in and has discovered, oh, that's a fallacy. There's no such thing as an objective universe. That's a nonsensical idea that the act of observing this universe, similar to a dream, actually influences the universe observed. And so the observed um, the, the observer and the active observation are all interconnected, inseparable parts of one quantum system. And so what that's pointing out is that, so the implication of that is that, wait, so there's no objective world separate from me, and that's actually pointing at, wait, so the act of observation is invoking the universe that I'm observing, which is to say the act of observation is creative. So quantum physics is unlocking this incredible creativity. It's also pointing at, at an expression of the dreamlike nature of reality. And when you discover that there's no such thing as an objective universe, well, what happened to the subject? Because the subject needs an object to be in relationship to. But if there's no object, all of a sudden, quantum physics is promoting itself to become a spiritual path because it's pointing at, wait a second, if there's no objective universe, then who I've been imagining myself to be as a subject, as a reference point in third dimensional space and time, i.e. as an ego, all of a sudden the floor gets pulled out from under that. Wait a second, who am I? You see, who is the, exactly, who is, who, who is the I to begin with, who yeah. I think, right? <laughs> right, right, right. And that's where, and I can say a lot more about this, yeah. where quantum physics, because I, I actually say it is the actual medicine, what the revelations of quantum physics are showing us, it's the medicine for Watiko. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. So, you know, that's very interesting with quantum physics because I, I also dabbled into it uh, a little bit. And, you know, it's almost you become to the own, it's, it's almost a scientific approach to a spiritual realization yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. in a sense, right? Yeah. Because it's, it's for me the same in my own, own spiritual practice and working now towards unification of the divine, my true self and the disillusion of, uh, of separation, so to speak. And, but it's also interesting because I want to get this and uh, definitely want to get also deep into quantum physics in the second hour, but there's also something to be said. I've seen, and I know you talked about this as well, we, we touched upon it, about the new age, you know, and how the new age has almost hijacked or, or oversimplified quantum physics mm -hmm. in this kind of distorted form of reality creation, right? Of like, I just ignore what I don't want to see and I always look what I want to see and I create my reality in this solipsistic, solipsistic uh, yeah, yeah. bubble. Right. No, totally. And that, I mean, that really, I had to be really careful because I didn't want my book. I, I'm so personally triggered by a lot of the new age books that, you know, sort of, oh, you know, quantum physics, quantum physics can help you become a millionaire or you know, solve your relationship problems or whatever. And so on the one hand, yeah, I had to navigate, you know, whatever with reference to that um, because there's something incredibly profound about quantum. I mean, it's being called the greatest discovery ever in human history, mm -hmm. in the realm of science. And that there's no debate about. The debate is, what does it mean? And so the idea being that with, the, with those like new age um, books on quantum physics, first off, they can be really sort of in a, in a materialistic way, focusing on, you know, gaining stuff, which is not the point at all. 
but it can also be like um, thinking that who's the I who's like, oh, I want to affirm this. And it, 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 you know, it might not be fully understanding who that I is, you know, because if you really shed light on that, who you've been imagining yourself to be, you discover that that doesn't exist in the way you've been imagining it to. And that opens you up to a way deeper reality in which material stuff isn't as important as a lot of these books are presenting, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, and it's just a spiritual, it's like a spiritual bypass. Like we all, you know, we've seen that in so many different arenas. and. Um, yeah, and I, I can say so much because I'm hesitant because I know we're getting close to the end. Yeah, I can say a lot about quantum physics, you know. Okay, yeah. So let's uh, let's do this definitely. Let's take um, do this in the second hour. Go dive deep into quantum physics and also maybe talk about some other teachings that relate to where Tika also want to touch upon, uh, you know, the importance of just meditation, embodiment, and certain sp spiritual practices mm -hmm. and looking at it all from the higher uh, picture of the evolution of consciousness and the times we're in, bringing it all together. Uh, but yeah, the second hour, just again, for uh, all the audience of this podcast is available for members. Um, you can also have access to the forum. And if you're not already a member, feel free to check it out or sign up at veil of veil of reality.com. And again, Paul Levy's, uh, Levy's, excuse me, uh, website is awaken in the dream.com. That's one word awaken in the dream.com. See you everyone guys on the second part. Okay, thank you. Thank you.